It's really understanding how generationally people are thinking differently. How are our clients' needs and challenges changing? How do we continue to evolve and and adapt uh, in order to serve that? Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I'm speaking with Jenna Knudsen, the Managing Principal of Co Architects, who are based in Los Angeles. So whilst working at Co, she has led award-winning large-scale academic laboratory and healthcare projects on university and healthcare campuses across the country. Since 1998, apart from a brief stint at Rafael Vanoli Architects, she has been with Co Architects and has progressed her career from project designer to managing principal. Within both the practice and the profession, Jenna has been a long-time advocate for equal representation, spearheading initiatives to support and encourage women in architecture. In this episode, we discuss what it takes to manage a firm into perpetuity, the characteristics of a great leader in 2022, and how co-architects develop new business relationships and move into new sectors. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. So you uh, you you always had an interest in the business side of of the practice, um, yes. and as you were developing through your career, you were asking questions and getting more and more involved in those sorts of 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 elements. How did you prepare then for the succession to happen? How did the practice plan for it? Was it a was it a quick announcement and then it happened and there was a new face of the practice, or was this something much more gradual and your kind of ownership stakes were, you know, took, took time, if you like? Uh, it was over a year in the making um, mm-hmm. in terms of working with my predecessor and, you know, really being very thoughtful about the transition and making sure you know, that, that, that we worked together, uh, and we still do, he's still in the practice. And so, um, you know, that, that's very helpful to have him, uh, here with me, uh, as well. The announcement was, was made, um, internally on a Friday and then externally on a Monday. So, um, while there was, you know, quite a bit of work occurring, um, to, to prepare, uh, the, the announcement, you know, did, did occur, uh, at, at, at a, you know, a time and, and then we made that switch. Mm. How, how would you describe the role of managing principal? What are your, what are your duties and how, how does it differ from being an architect? Well, um, I, Luckily, I'm one of many partners. Um, so, you know, we do, there is a partnership um, and we, you know, we uh, certainly work together in terms of leading the practice. Uh, as the managing principal, I would say it's, you know, it's my responsibility to, um, you know, be sort of understanding everything that's occurring within the practice and um, making sure that it's cared for and uh, not necessarily doing all of that myself, right? But, um, but ensuring that, that somebody is, um, you know, watching over the practice. Um, I mean, that includes, um, you know, the projects that we have, uh, the projects that we, you know, and the clients that we are currently working with, the business development in terms of, you know, where we wanna go. Um, setting strategy uh, is obviously, you know, a big part of the role. Um, making sure, you know, sort of the the business and the finances, um, you know, so sort of, you know, overseeing all of that, working with the CFO, um, you know, and making sure that I am reaching out to my partners, uh, you know, talking with them, understanding, you know, 12 people are not always going to agree on everything, um, but mm-hmm. we're very much a consensus-based organization. And so, 
it's important that, um, you know, that people are heard. And the, it's interesting, you said you worked at um, Vanoli for, for a period. And I know at Vanoli's practice, he's not necessarily the managing partner, but assumes a kind of creative director role. And there is a managing partner there who's who just purely manages the business and doesn't necessarily get that involved in the day to day designing of of projects. Um, how did, how has your role been split like that between kind of creative tasks or is it purely like leadership management and facilitating design through others? Yeah. So I, I'm, I mean, the role of managing principal at Coarchitects has always involved project, um, you know, working on projects, um, Mm -hmm. my, my, you know, all the predecessors, um, have done that and do feel that it's important that, you know, to stay in the projects. Um, you know, if I think the thinking is if, if you get too removed from the projects, um, it, it becomes, things are changing so rapidly, you know, the way we, we sort of work and deliver, um, and so, you know, really wanting to stay connected. Also, it's, you know, it's kind of why we all became architects, right, to, to work on projects. Um, you know, that said, I'm in a leadership role on projects. Um, you know, typically the, the role would be uh, principal in charge. Um, depending on the size of the project, there's, you know, likely a um, design principal um, or, you know, someone who has the responsibility of, um, of generating the overall design direction. Um, and then, you know, we would partner in terms of, you know, the design, the execution, the uh, co- communication with the client. Um, yeah. Got so, it. I mean, I think, you know, uh, we always say we're a practice of generalists. I would say I definitely fall into that category. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, I care about design a lot. Um, certainly, you know, uh, speak to to the design uh, internally and externally with the clients. So when it comes to the more strategic part of the role in a, a managing principle, what sorts of strategic decisions are you looking at on a daily basis? What sorts of planning or visioneering aspects are you looking to navigate in the business which what are the things that either keep you up at night or are the things that are constantly uh on top of mind as in your position well uh i mean maybe i'll talk a little bit about how we've done that and um we have an annual retreat that includes the principals and the associate principals and over the last couple of years we've also had a kind of second retreat uh with the principals so uh, in addition to a weekly meeting uh, where the principals uh, meet and check in, we have one to two uh, off-sites a year, and that's where we really, you know, sort of poll people, you know, what what are the concerns, what's going on in the practice that we really need to think about in the profession, and, you know, we'll spend a couple of days uh, talking about that. Often coming out of that, that is sort of the charge. Uh, you know, what, what, are the, what are the things we need to be thinking about? Um, I think that also is in the context of, of um, you know, wh- where, where are we going? Where is the industry going? Um, you know, I think one example is we've, we've seen project delivery really change quite a bit over um, the last... 10 years, 10 years ago was all about integrated project delivery. Uh, We were doing several projects, uh, you know, that I would call some form of integrated project delivery. We still are, but now a lot more design build. Um, So I think it's also really, you know, thinking about what's happening in the industry, what's happening in in construction, um, and, you know, how is that going to impact us going forward? Also just market sectors, you know, kind of understanding what's going on in our different market sectors. Um, you know, we we are diversified uh, in in the market sectors. Um, you know, uh, so that I think is helpful in terms of you know kind of ebbs and flows uh, of, of project types. But you know, it's a lot of um, I think thinking about 
you know, what, what's happening, where do we need to be going? And then, you know, how are we positioning ourselves for that? So that might be for a specific project that we, uh, you know, or a specific client that we want to work with. And, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, not coming out for a year or two years or, you know, that, con that client can be a contractor. Um, so it's a lot of, you know, thinking ahead. Yeah. Um, in terms of, it's interesting that you're saying you're looking into market sectors and some of the challenges that some of your um, sectors that you're working in are facing and identifying trends. What does business development look like within the practice in, in general? And is that something that, you're, that you lead up or is there a team that's involved in business development and you kind of oversee and set strategy for them? So we do have a uh, one of my partners uh, who is a principal. Um, she is the marketing director, and so um, you know her job every day is marketing and business development. Um, all the principals and uh, are also responsible for business development. So um, you know it's a, it's certainly a group effort. Um, depending on the project type. It can be more regional for us. Um, uh, the healthcare work is fairly regional. Um, we, we do work a bit outside of California, but that's largely in Southern California. Um, and mm -hmm. then, you know, as an example, the um, the our health sciences work, schools of medicine, pharmacy, nursing, uh, that we do all over the country. So a lot of it is understanding, um, and and much of that is is on is campuses, college campuses. So. Part of the business development is um, going and meeting with campuses. This is well ahead of any project. Um, you know, uh, meeting with potential partner architects, consultants, contractors, you know, just talking to people, understanding what's going on, um, what might be coming, you know, what could be a good fit. We, we track all of those um, weekly in a marketing meeting. Uh, you know, to really uh, continually update, you know, both just relational business development um, and then, you know, very specific projects that we're tracking. So um, typically if something, if we haven't heard of something and an RFP comes out, um, you know, then, then we've really missed, um, we, we usually know it's coming. So that so that's very interesting, and then there's quite a difference between a more sophisticated business and perhaps a younger practice. Is the identifying clients or potential prospective clients well ahead of time, as you as you put it, rather than just responding to the RFQ or the RF, RFI? That's often a little bit too late, and it's quite important to be involved in those conversations for as far upstream as possible. Um, so, so has that has that always been the case that you guys have always endeavored to do that and and what does that process look like yeah i think i think that that has been the case as long as i have been in the practice um i think you know there's there's different ways that that firms can approach business development and i think obviously you know as you mentioned that would probably depend on um, you know, your size and your, your portfolio of work. Um, but I think we have found that, you know, to be very targeted and to um, really think about relationships is, is the way that we can be most successful. And so that can often lead to, you know, working for the same client um, over and over, which is, you know, very good, um, business development, but there, you know, it's competitive. The, the projects, project pursuits are competitive. And so, um, and resources are not infinite, right? They are limited. And so, um, you know, we want to be really thoughtful and focused in, in what we pursue. Are there, um, certain sectors that you'll, you know, at any one time, be spending more time and energy on pursuing work in there and we, we a, like to have a what well, we call you know ones. a balanced uh portfolio and um and so for us that's healthcare science and technology health sciences k through 12 and then we will typically have 
you know, maybe uh, some in interiors or workplace, um, some other, you know, uh, projects, cultural projects, courts. And, uh, and so, you know, the goal is that you, that that looks, you know, we do kind of the pie chart, that the pie chart looks fairly balanced. In reality, um, you know, there might be something, some legislation, you know, that's driving uh, a lot of healthcare at any given time or, uh, you know, kind of monies coming from, you know, the state or, or federal government um, in, you know, in, in research. Um, and so, you know, again, it's, it's sort of seeing where those are headed um, and what's coming and, um, you know, and then, you know, what's our capacity to, to do the work. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, certainly I think at, at times, uh, you know, one market sector might be a bigger um, piece of the pie. Um, and so, you know, we may say, well, you know, we're good on that one for now. You know, let's focus a little bit more on, on another one. But over time, that it's constantly all of them. So over the last 35 years plus or so um, with, with the practice and, and your involvement, so pretty much your most of your career has been here at, 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 at this firm. Yeah. Um, you would have seen the company survive and weather a number of economic recession, recessions and, and downturns. What has been some of the principles, if you like, for doing that successfully? And is it built into what you're saying here about the diverse portfolio? I, I think the, the diverse portfolio is certainly um, a part of that. Um, I think that traditionally institutional work doesn't quite have the, um, often the projects are funded and so, you know, they, they will, you know, proceed, um, while other types of projects may, you know, may, uh, go on pause. Not, but not that that never happens, but you know, that, that has traditionally happened. Um, and so, you know, it is a, it is a kind of steady, uh, type of work. Um, we're also really thoughtful about, about hiring, um, and you know, how we, you know, again, that's the kind of thinking ahead. Um, you know, we really do not want to hire people for projects. Um, we want to hire people for co-architects and, you know, so again, I think being really thoughtful, um, about, you know, about how and when we hire um, and what is, you know, what is the outlook. Yeah. So hiring, obviously, this is one of the, particularly in the last year or so, has been incredibly challenging for a lot of practices. Um, how how typically does the, does the firm go about that process? Yeah, I mean, what was interesting and is... How do you retain in, talent? In 2020... Um, you know, obviously the world changed um, rather quickly and, and that impacted uh, architecture, uh, architectural practices differently. We were very fortunate to uh, essentially have our projects move forward and win work. So at that time, we started hiring people, uh, even though we were not in an office, and, uh, and you know, sort of figuring out how, how to onboard people remotely. And we're fortunate to um, bring some really great people in into the practice um, at a time where you know a lot of firms were not hiring, um, and that is kind of that is continued. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the last year has gotten uh, everybody's picked up. Uh, you know, everybody, I, uh, all, all the offices we know are busy, and um, and so there's been movement. You know, movement across firms, um, and certainly. Um, you know, we've continued to grow and, um, and bring in really good people. Uh, you know, we're kind of always thinking about retention. Um, you know, this is an interesting time, uh, because I think I, I can't really think of another time in history where sort of everybody is, you know, rethinking, uh, you know, her, how and where they want to work. Um, and so, you know, that's definitely uh, something that we're talking about in the practice. 
Um, you know, I think the the goal that we have always set is, uh, you know, one of the reasons that I have stayed at Co, been at Co for so long and stayed, um, I think one is that uh, I have the opportunity and have had the opportunity to work on many different projects uh, across different project types. We're not organized as studios, um, so I could, you know, work on a hospital, and then I could work on a school of medicine, and then I could work on a high school. Uh, and so there's a lot of diversity there in terms of uh, opportunities. Um, also, I think we we really try to give people uh, incredible amounts of opportunity. Uh, and so, you know, it's a place where if you um, are willing you know, then um, then you're going to get get the opportunity, and um, and our job is to provide you know the kind of resources uh, with which people can be can be successful. You, you you mentioned there was obviously people are beginning to question, you know, what does their work life balance look like, and there's a big question as well as the future of the office place, um, and you know more and more employees and team members now. Um, are, you know, there's a different. There's certainly, particularly with the, the younger team members, a, a different set of priorities and a different set of motivations, and, and they're not all financially based. Um, so, freedom of work and purposeful work, these becoming more and more at the forefront for for everybody. Um, how has Co been dealing with that and kind of evolving? with that and the and evolving with an ever more complex workplace. Yeah, I mean work life balance has you know is not a pandemic topic, right? It it certainly existed um prior and um something that you know we've been discussing in in our company um for years. Uh, probably largely initiated out of uh, a group of women, uh, at a committee here that we call WOCO. Um, that you know that conversation has certainly evolved, um, but I think at the core is trying to recognize that people are different, and um, and we you know, we want flexibility. Um, and, and so, you know, I think our goal is always to consider that, uh, to think about, you know, how can we make co a place where, you know, people want to work, where parents can work, right. Um, where, you know, people, uh, don't feel that they are um, sacrificing, you know, uh, everything, uh, or it's not possible to be successful, um, you know, and and have a life. Uh, personally, I don't like the term work-life balance. Um, to me, it feels like it's separating work from life, and also that it's some precarious thing that you know you have to to balance. Yes, it could, um, it, it could tip over at any time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, at any moment, um, I prefer to think of, you know, a kind of a blend or integration, um, that probably comes from my own, uh, upbringing. My parents were realtors, uh, you know, they kind of worked all the time, but also, you know, uh, were with, were with us and family and vacation, you know, so just, it kind of all mixed together and, in one pot. Uh, my grandfather also owned a grocery store. He was my first employer. So my kind of life experiences are, um, you know, you work and you have family and, you know, they all kind of, mm -hmm. uh, mix, mix together. Um, but, but, you know, now, uh, certainly after two years of, um, you know, people working remotely, uh, which certainly has, you know, had some benefits and some challenges and it's very personal, uh, you know, as we've come back to the office and we, we have asked um, people to be in the office three days a week and, and we're trying to have those days together, um, you know, really trying to find the right mix of, um, you know, kind of time where people can work remotely should they choose, 
but time to be together in the office and to create opportunities and spaces in the office where people can work in different ways. Um, you know, so we have more huddle rooms, uh, you know, kind of a lot of outdoor space, um, you know, and the ability to, um, you know, if you need to go in a room by yourself, um, you know, we have a wellness room and, you know, so just kind of creating, I think, the uh, different amenities. Uh, and, and we are currently, uh, we do have two remote work days. Got it. Okay, so so the remote work days are are shared with everybody. They were, you have the same day of the week allocated for remote work days, and then we do. there's a set number of days where everyone needs to be in the office. We do, and that's kind of. that was uh, you know we did some some research and some surveys, and and that was our approach to pilot, and so we've been doing that mm-hmm. for almost five months now, and um, for yeah four and a half months. And, um, and so we're, are, are about to undertake a survey uh, to get some feedback. So it's, it's interesting um, when you're talking about dis- making decisions like this, and obviously you've got uh, 21 shareholders, 12 principals, is that right? And then roughly 160 um, team members that the communication between all those different parts must get quite complicated at times. How do you... How do you structure decision making processes? So something like, you know, an, an approach to how you're going to um, best manage or, or or bring about remote working. What does the process look like? Yeah, it's a good question, and and certainly as we grow, we continue to think about the decision making process. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are a consensus based organization. Uh, uh, so that's that's not just you know that certainly is with the leadership group, um, but uh, you know our, it's important that we understand you know sort of at all levels of the organization uh, what people are thinking. Uh, and so certainly I think like many other organizations during the pandemic, we did a number of surveys, you know, to really understand. Initially, it was a lot about you know how can we make people's home work you know, uh, work for as many people as possible because obviously, you know, people had children at home and, you know, working out of closets and, you know, kind of all, all different things. And so that was really, you know, the, a recognition we're going to probably be at this for a while. So let's make sure yeah. uh, that people have the right, the right resources. And then, you know, as uh, we actually moved offices during the pandemic, so we were designing a new space. Um, and so as we were thinking about uh, coming back, uh, together or moving forward, as we say, because we are moving to a new space, you know, really thinking about uh, what are the activities and reasons to be in the office, um, you know, what, what, and what do people feel they can do well at home? And I don't, you know, it's probably no surprise that sort of focused work, you know, was, uh, was, was uh, better at home um, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, collaboration and, you know, sort of social Um, opportunities at the office. And um, so, you know, one thing was, uh, you know, asking uh, the employees, uh, both in a kind of, you know, survey, um, as well as um, we put together a group um, that was uh, associate principals and principals. And, you know, we really sort of worked through what are, you know, what are other organizations doing? Um, I mean, but at the end, we kind of came back to, you know, who are we? What are our values? What's our culture? And um, and what did we hear from, you know, from from the the staff? Uh, and then, you know, the that group made a, you know, a kind of series of recommendations uh, to the management committee. And then the management committee made those recommendations to the principles. So, it, you know, uh, big decisions go through, you know, a number of groups, um, you know, kind of both formally and informally, um, you know, just to, to try to, um, I think, gather the opinions with which to, you know, come up with a recommendation. Mm-hmm. In, in terms of decisions around finances and the kind of projections of the business and where resources are going to be allocated how are those kind of decisions uh made 
in the leadership and and how involved is the rest of the office in terms of transparency with the finances of the company? Well, I mean, every year we, you know, we create a budget, uh, you know, we, we project, you know, what we think is going to be our, our revenue, uh, you know, and obviously a lot of this is based on historical data and then, you know, where we think things are going, um, you know, and we'll create budgets for, um, you know, for each of the pots, obviously, you know, there are certain, um, certain things, um, you know, rent, for example, or, you know, that's kind of steady. And then, you know, what, what do we think we're going to spend in marketing this year? What do we think we're going to spend in IT? And so we, you know, we develop a budget and then uh, every month we sort of look at it in cor- uh, quarterly, you know, there's an, an uh, the CFO works on an analysis that, um, you know, really, really digs in on, you know, where are we? Um, we're obviously looking, you know, kind of monthly at performance of projects and, um, you know, so it's a, it's a looking back, you know, and, and looking forward. Uh, a lot of that is, um, you know, there, there's not huge variations year to year, I guess, you know, uh, um, relative to the, you know, the sort of buckets. Um, as I mentioned, the management committee, uh, the management committee does make the kind of day-to-day decisions on, um, I'll call small, (laughs) you know, small, uh, financial decisions. Um, you know, the, uh, somebody, you know, wants to, um, you know, host something, you know, uh, or we have an opportunity to, you know, uh, make a donation to something or, you know, certain things like that. So, you know, again, there's a group of seven um, that's really making those kinds of decisions. And it's typically informed, you know, in, you know, sort of, here's the donations we've made last year. Here's, you know, here's our, you know, here's what we want to do this year, you know? So mm-hmm. there's, you know, again, it's the kind of looking forward and looking back large financial decisions, um, would go to, would go to the principals. Um, but a lot of it is really, you know, sort of pre-thought in terms of the budget and, um, and then it's, you know, just kind of working through that. Yeah. Um, is there a level of transparency where the where you I know some businesses they'll have like a a one page business plan for example that they present to the rest of the to the team where you show kind of profits and the margins and targets and revenue. Yeah, yeah, do good ha- question. Um, we we do um, we so pre pandemic about four times a year we had what we call the state of the office and it was an all office presentation. Right. And, um, and that has sort of evolved during the pandemic. We had a weekly town hall, um, and that was really just, you know, because we need to be communicating um, very frequently. And now we continue to have the town hall. It's, it's every other week. Um, but that is a venue uh, where uh, a couple of times a year we will look at, you know, here's where we are in marketing uh, there's always kind of the historical data, your questions about, you know, market sectors, you know, right. Mm-hmm. so it's kind of seeing, seeing the trends over the, the years and where we think, you know, we're going next year. Uh, and then say, you know, the same would be with the finances. So you know, looking at, you know, at net revenue, um, typically we look at net revenue, but, you know, gross revenue, net revenue, um, and, and yeah, trying to share, uh, with, you know, with, with everyone, you know, be, be fairly transparent in terms of mm-hmm. the, the finances. Um, and, and, and I guess on a more granular level, um, individual projects are closely monitored and you're looking at what the, what the spend is there. How, how where is there like a, a line or a boundary between the financial information of a particular project and the delivery team? Or is it very useful that, you know, your project architects, they're aware of how much the budget is, is, is being spent so that they're able to communicate to the team how many hours is allocated to the project? Yeah, we have. So um, every project um, monthly meets to look at, you know, the hours spent. And again, there's a sort of projection for the entire project and then an analysis of how are we doing against that projection. Um, and so, 
you know, that typically involves uh, a principal and a, a project manager or a project architect. Um, and so there, yeah, there's definitely uh, the conversation and awareness about, you know, how are we doing um, relative to the resources we projected and what we're using. And, you know, obviously month, you know, month over month, there's a nuance, right? And so you can say, yeah, we, we had a deadline, we were running hot this month, you know, mm-hmm. but I but expect it will go down or, you know, we don't have enough staff or we have too, too many, too, you know, too many people. And, um, and again, that those are tools, right? It's not a perfect, you know, you can only spend X number of hours. Um, you know, we, we need to get the work done and, and, um, and it's important that we do that well. Um, but, you know, understanding the, the metrics and, and the planning is, is important. So, um, you know, there's, it's not something that we, um, you know, sort of, uh, rule our business by, you know, in a sense Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, uh, I think, you know, we'll often say, okay, you're 50, 50 on this project or that project, but it's not very common to say, you know, you get 12 hours for this and eight hours for that and this many hours, you know, um, but I think anybody who's interested in kind of understanding the work planning um, would have the opportunity to, you know, to be involved in that. Right. Got it. Uh, in terms of accountability, so obviously you as the, the principal of the company, the, one of the most difficult challenges that you might have is how do you hold other people accountable for things that they said that they were going to do? without creating like a punitive environment or, you know, from whether it be, you know, the the youngest or most junior team member to other partners and holding each other accountable. How does how does a culture of accountability operate at, at Co? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, I, I think, well, we, you know, formally we have uh, annual performance reviews and the, um, you know, the, everybody, um, from the, the principals and the associate principals do something different. And I'll explain that in a second, but the, all other staff, you know, there's a, there's a formal review process. Um, it includes, you know, kind of goal setting and five-year plan. Um, and then, you know, sort of working, uh, you know, working through, through that and, um, thinking about, you know, feedback, um, that's obviously an opportunity uh, to, you know, to share uh, any comments. I think what we've all learned is, you know, uh, feedback once a year is not enough <laughs> and telling somebody, you know, something they could have done better, you know, nine months ago is sort of frustrating um, yeah. because, it, you know, you, you could have been improving it. Um, you know, so I, I think we try, uh, you know, it's not always easy, but try to provide um, you know, kind of feedback in the moment about about ways which which people can improve. I, I think often because, as I mentioned, we you know uh, we are interested in 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 giving people opportunities. Um, I think they relish the feedback. You know, they know that there's learning to do, and and so if there's you know opportunities to tell them where they're doing really good, and you know where where they might have improvement. Um, related, we have an education budget, so every single person um, has uh, money that they can use to, uh, you know, to take a, take a public speaking class, you know, go to a seminar, um, go to a conference. Um, we didn't talk about it in business development, but we do go to a lot of conferences that are sort of, and speak at them. Um, mm-hmm. that are specific to our, our market sectors. And so, um, you know, really trying to get people to, you um, continually improve. We all, we all, you know, can continue to improve. The, the principals and the associate principals, um, we set a kind of plan each year for ourselves. And, um, and then at the end of the year, um, you know, we individually look at how did I do against that plan? And, um, and then we, you know, we share that amongst, amongst the partners, um, in terms of, you know, where, where, where were my goals and in, in the goal setting, uh, and focus setting, each of us will meet with two others to sort of talk through that. Um, so Mm -hmm. that we can have feedback at the time, you know, why are you focusing so much on this? I think you could focus on that. And, you know, so it, again, it's, um, you know, it's very much a kind of team based collaborative approach to, 
uh, how are we all moving forward together and um, and where can you know each person focus and you know and and uh, and then where can we improve and adjust for next year obviously you've you've been with the business now for a, a long period of time um, and you've seen the business grow and evolve and shift and change and respond to different marketplaces and you know, there's a difference a difference in scale. How would you describe the difference in challenges that you've seen of the practice deal with? So the challenges that you're facing now, and also the challenges in your own role as as a as the as the principal. Um, how have they changed versus, say, at the early stages of your career and in the early stages of of the business or earlier stages? Well, I think the business has changed a lot, um, or we have seen for sure the delivery models change and that is kind right. of constantly changing um you know technology has has changed the way we deliver i would say has also uh allowed for much accelerated schedules so projects are faster um and uh and i think technology has had the great benefit of you know better coordination uh, better sets of documents, um, but also allows us to do some, com you know, complex shapes and, you know, com in complexity in, in buildings that, um, you know, were not as common. Um, our interface, uh, and, and we see this as very positive, but it is a change, our ability to interface with the contractor and the trade contractors is exponential compared to when I first started and, you know, almost everything was design, bid, build. Um, and you just spent years, you know, creating a set of documents and then you threw it over to a contractor and then you defended those documents uh, as, as it got built. Um, now it's a much more collaborative process. Um, I think that's a great benefit mm -hmm. to a younger uh, professional as well to, you know, be able to sit you know, on a Zoom or, you know, in a room uh, with the framing contractor or the exterior cladding contractor or, you know, a mechanical contractor and really understand uh, that what we're, you know, drawing and designing, uh, you know, needs to be constructible. And, and, um, and so those, you know, those are great relationships um, and opportunities, but it's a, you know, it's a change. And so certainly the way that, you um, that we deliver the pace of the projects, um, you know, has evolved. Um, what was the second part of the question? How have those, how have the challenges changed in your own career, in your own career path? Yeah, I think, you know, I spend less time, you know, thinking about solving a specific piece of a building, um, mm. you know, or, generating a you know a drawing or or a design and I spend you know more time thinking about how are others doing that how is it all coming together uh you know are we serving our client um you know so I think at a project level that that's certainly the difference uh you know we'll often say you know when somebody sort of transitions from you know to from doing to you know to overseeing or leading right and and um, and so that's a you know how to do it yourself now you're trying to you know teach somebody else how to do it without telling them you know from A to Z how to do it um, and so you know that's always a kind of interesting transition and 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 different challenge um, you know obviously I I have to think much more about you know, the entirety of co-architects um, in, in my role. And so, it, you know, but I think what is common is a lot of it is still relational, right? It's still mm. um, about people and, um, you know, that, I mean, ultimately, you know, we are the people, right? We are the people that, um, you know, that's our organization. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's really understanding how the, how generationally people are thinking differently, you know, what are, how, what are, how are our clients' uh, needs and challenges changing, um, and, 
you know, how do we continue to evolve and, and adapt uh, in order to serve that? Final, final question here. What would you say are the, are the great characteristics of a, of a great leader? You know, it's, it's interesting. We, we have a program here at Co that we call Co University, and um, each we've been probably doing it for 10 years. Each year there's a class of about 12 to 15 um, people, and it's usually our new associates and, and then sometimes some, some others. And it's, it's six classes uh, of different um, topics. Uh, some more very, you know, sort of specific to co-architects, the business marketing, you know, some of those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, but the first, the first class is about leadership. And uh, that's one that I've been involved in for, for the last uh, number of years. And I think what's, what's interesting is how the conversation around leadership has really changed. Um, and what people see as a good leader has really changed. Uh, I think it used to be sort of much more about kind of decisiveness and power and and the language has changed you hear it's a lot more about um emotional intelligence and mm. um and so uh maybe that's good for me because i think that, <laughs> that that's some of the uh the strengths that i have or that i think um make a good leader i think being a good listener is is kind of right uh, at the top of um, of being a good leader. Uh, I think you need to be a good communicator. Um, empathy, I think, is important. I think you need to be an optimist, um, a, maybe a realist, but but an optimist, and um, you know, which means having some resiliency and um, and uh, I. I think there's no substitute for work ethic. I, I, I really, you know, believe that, that that is important to any, any leader. Uh, you need to have kind mm -hmm. of put in the time and done the work to understand, you know, sort of w what others are, are doing as well. Really interesting list um, of qualities there, like emotional intelligence, listening, empathy, communication. Um, what is it about those these sort of relationship building qualities that are so important where does that where does it where do these come into play if you like i mean i think it comes into play um daily the workplace i, I would say the people want, want to be heard right they 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 want to have a voice um whether that's your client right telling you we're not interested in this, right? We're interested in that, or you're not solving our problem. This is our problem, um, you know, or, you know, employees and, and, uh, and that could be from, you know, the experiences that they want to get or the, you know, the challenges that they're, that they're having, um, you know, how, how can they grow professionally? Um, I, I think if you don't listen, uh, and then be able to communicate effectively, uh, you are you are missing right you are missing out on you know sort of what what is happening in your organization in the profession with your clients mm -hmm. um, and because those things evolve and are constantly evolving um, if you're not paying attention uh, which is you know in my mind listening uh, then I think you're missing out amazing Brilliant. Perfect place to conclude the conversation there, Jenna. Thank you so much for that deep dive into the practice and your, your career. And I love these qualities of a, of a great leader. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.